is a comedian who Rolling Stone called the undisputed heavyweight champion of rage-fueled humor. Please welcome Bill Burr. Bill Burr has spent most of his career perfecting what Rolling Stone is calling rage-filled humor. What makes Bill Burr so effective can be summarized in the opening minute of this interview with Colbert. Rage-filled humor? I don't even think I'm mad. You don't think that's fair? No, you don't I think, think the description is? No, I'm just old. <laughs> this is how people used to talk, and then I just lived long enough, and people brought it down. You know? People are too more. polite yeah, now? They're just, not only that polite, they're just, they're nicer. They're pleasant. He goes on to describe why he believes candy stores are ruining America, but he very quickly emphasizes the three core parts to his comedy. Bill Burr does not feel at home in the world, but he's honestly trying to communicate with people. He's just not doing it well. As someone who is ostensibly going through a midlife crisis, a lot of his material is focused around his fear of aging. And while I typically think that this is a pointless fear, I can see why this scares him. That the old redneck on Duck Dynasty, that dude got in trouble. The owner of the Clippers got in trouble. And I'm not saying what these people did wasn't offensive. I'm not saying that shit. I'm just, what pissed me off was at no point during all of these stories did anybody address their age. They're fucking old. You know? What did you think they thought? You never talked to a grandparent and asked the wrong question and all of a sudden it went down this crazy road. It makes sense that this would scare him because Bill gets a ton of flack for his comedy, which is antagonistic. But here's the thing. Bill Burr hates everything. Women, children, pedophiles, corporations, marriages, his wife, his friends, politicians, candy stores, hugs, the South, and cruises. Granted, that last one's a pretty popular choice, but to put it simply, this guy has contempt for humanity and for 90% of activities. Oh my God. And the reason this scares him so much is because he can see the world changing today and imagine himself being ostracized from society later in life. Now, no one enjoys staring down their own mortality, but I gotta admit, it really feels like he's on borrowed time. It's one of the sad things about life. You get old and it passes you by. I feel it passing me by. I'm 46 years old. I don't even have kids, but I can't keep up anymore. I'll get in trouble later on in my life. Transgender athletes, I don't fucking understand that. That's a really new concept to me, that you can be a dude, right? Ranked 80th in the fucking world. You have your dick cut off, you put on a sports bra, and now you're the number one tennis player in the world just coming out there with your man shoulders. That doesn't seem fair. I might be wrong. I might just be an old guy. I have no idea. One time she was watching this show. It was like a poor excuse for The View, and they started talking about domestic violence, right? For the nine millionth time this year, they're talking about domestic violence. Bear with me on this. I know it's easy to get defensive right off the bat. He is being antagonistic and dismissive towards domestic violence victims, but his issue's not actually with them. They come to the logical conclusion. They're like, there is no reason to hit a woman. There is no reason to hit a woman. And I was just like, really? I could give you like 17 right off the top of my head. You could wake me from a drunken stupor, I could still give you like nine. Dude, there's plenty of reasons to hit a woman. You just don't do it. This is the core of his position, which is also the part I think that is most misunderstood. He is separating the act from the desire, and right or wrong, he believes that the desire to hit someone and actually hitting them are two separate things. He thinks it's human nature to sometimes want to hit someone else. He doesn't think that this is exclusive to men, and he confirms this pretty quickly. And then he spends the next minute emphasizing the point. <laughs> Women, how many times have you thought about slapping your you fucking guy in the head this week. Every day. There you go. Every day. You didn't do it, right? Oh, dude, it drives me nuts. There's no reason. There's no reason. Really? No reason? How about this? You marry a girl, you fall in love, you buy her a house. You go to work every day, paying off the house. You come home one day, she's banging the next door neighbor, hands you divorce papers. You got to move out, sleep on a futon, and still pay for that house that she's going to stay in. No reason. I'm not saying you should do it, but there's plenty of fucking reasons. My biggest issue with this joke is that it's not extreme enough. If you took a more extreme example, it would be easier to get the joke because the premise itself would be more ridiculous. He was known to drive around town in this Ferrari that OJ bought for her. <laughs> Think about that shit. I'll buy you a car. You gonna let another man drive around in my car? Are you out of your fucking 
fucking mind? Shit. God, you better recognize. Shit, I don't even have Ferrari. But if I saw somebody driving my Pinto, that shit would blow up like the Godfather. And I'm not saying he should have killed her. But I understand. Now, does anyone actually think that Chris Rock is advocating murder in this scenario or simply acknowledging that having these thoughts is a natural human response while also agreeing that you just don't do it? To be clear, I'm not stating that Bill Burr is never offensive. There's a weakness in my act, man, that I have to work on. I notice, like, anytime I'm imitating a moron, I always do it in a southern accent. <laughs> What I like about this is that Bill Burr acknowledges it very early on in his career, but a racist southern accent is a classic Bill Burr bit that he still performs today. He acknowledges that someone might find it offensive, but maintains that it's still a very funny joke. You ask a redneck if he wants to go to war, he's just like, hell fucking yeah! Yours goes, what, what? Mine goes, what? A fucking what? Like, hey man, you did what you had to do. Did what you had to do, man. You cannot have two species working together. You need a shotgun, man. It's got a good spread. It's easy to load, doesn't have a lot of working parts. It's got a good spread. He kept saying that. It's got a good spread. I'm like, what does that mean? He goes, well, it means you ain't got to be that accurate. It's got a good spread. The further away you are, the more shit you hit. It's got a good spread. In fact, you got a problem over here. You ain't even got to look, you just turn, wow, that's it! You ain't got a problem over here anymore. Anything that was even remotely a problem ain't there anymore, trust me. And then these people here, they saw what you just did here, you ain't got a problem here either, feel me? 90 degrees taken care of right there, one shot. These people get smart, flip it over, wow, that's it! It's got a good spread. So he does like that classic, like that redneck trailing off thing, like, ah, right, you want a pistol, go ahead and get a pistol. Well, I know, I've just been here 20 years, you know. Get a shiny one, right? Because life, life ain't a movie. He goes, well, look, you ever watch a movie? Guy go, blah, 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 he, he kills three people. Real life, man, you miss. You miss all the fucking time. You miss enough times, man, you might as well, you're empty. You might as well just be standing there with a big stapler in your hand. Man, what you gonna do? I was like, well, fuck it, let's get the shotgun. <laughs> 